Have you ever seen a plane flying upside down or inverted, as the pilot people say? You know, maybe you've seen that at an air show or maybe in the new Top Gun movie or the old Top Gun movie. What is the airplane that you picture in your heads when you think about a plane flying upside down? I can guarantee you're not picturing this. For those of you who are listening at home, I'm showing a big ass plane, a McDonnell Douglas DC 1030 cargo jet to be exact. It's painted in blue and red with the logo for FedEx on the side, which at the time was the words Federal Express just written on the side. If you're wondering, no, that plane is not designed to do that. But desperate times called for desperate measures. And thanks to three heroic men in April of 1994, plus some good luck and G-forces, well, the plane landed safely, even when you involve a spear gun and some hammers. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, true crime that doesn't take itself too seriously and obviously gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. Okay, important note here on the drink. Though this drink was inspired by the fact that Bloody Marys are often listed as the most famous in-flight cocktail, we are not doing the traditional airplane Bloody Mary. For that, you can just ask for the Bloody Mary mix and a vodka on your flight. It does the job just fine. But since we're not at 33,000 feet, we're going to be a little bit fancier. This drink is basically identical whether you're doing the cocktail or the mocktail. But if you're doing the mocktail, you just omit the vodka. So for this drink, you'll need vodka, tomato juice, lemon juice, Worcestershire sauce. Yeah, I did good pronouncing that, didn't I? Celery salt, black pepper, and anything you want for a garnish, uh, celery, pickles, anything that you want. And like I said, for the mocktail, you're just going to omit the vodka. So for the cocktail, you'll take two parts vodka, four parts tomato juice, one part lemon juice, and two or three dashes of Worcestershire sauce, and put it directly into your ice with glass. Stir it up. Add celery salt and black pepper to taste, and garnish with whatever you want to garnish with. For your mocktail, we'll take three parts tomato juice, a half a part lemon juice, a dash or four of Worcestershire sauce, and we'll put all of those directly into your glass with ice, add your celery, salt, and your black pepper to taste, and garnish with whatever you want to garnish with. So before I filmed this episode, I asked about eight people if they'd ever heard of this case, and despite the fact that all of them, or maybe almost all of them, had been alive when this happened, they'd never heard of it. I also hadn't heard of it, so I'm really excited to share it with you. Now, a bit of a trigger warning, this episode is quite violent and could easily have turned into a fair bit of mayhem and murder, but there is a happy ending. So let's get on board for some high-flying hijinks, shall we? Ooh. <laughs> Sorry. In 1965, a college junior named Frederick W. Smith wrote a paper in one of his undergraduate economics classes proposing a revolutionary way of shipping packages in a time-sensitive way. He got a C. Not taking a C for an answer, he founded Federal Express in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1971. They began official operations on April 17, 1973, in what continues to be their super hub today, Memphis, Tennessee. Auburn Calloway was born on December 15, 1951, and he graduated from Stanford University with a BA in African and African American Studies in 1974. He also served as a United States Navy flyer for five years, where he became an expert in martial arts. He was honorably discharged from the Navy with several medals of honor in 1982. He was described as a highly intelligent, driven person. He was focused on accomplishing goals and was well on his way to an illustrative career at Federal Express, a job he snagged on January 9, 1989, after working for several airlines previously. Some sources I found noted that he had some problems when he worked at those previous airlines, but I couldn't confirm that with a news outlet, so I'm not going to repeat the goss. 
On April 7, 1994, Auburn was 42 years old, living in a small apartment in Memphis, Tennessee, and working as a flight engineer. That morning, he boarded a McDonnell Douglas DC-1030 cargo jet branded with the Federal Express logo. As it turns out, this was likely one of the last flights on a plane that looked like this, with the red and blue coloring and the words Federal Express written out. In 1994, Federal Express had actually rebranded as FedEx and made that iconic logo with the hidden arrow in it. If you know, you know, and if you haven't seen it, when you see it, you won't be able to unsee it, if you know what I mean. Auburn had to make a last minute change to his plans. He had actually been scheduled to fly that day with a crew of two other people. The previous day, however, he'd gone over his flight time by exactly one minute. So they were replaced with a crew the following day. As it were, Auburn decided to continue to fly to the West Coast from Memphis on that Federal Express Flight 705. He had decided actually to capitalize on a benefit that airline employees across different airlines receive for working on at airlines. They call it jump seating or deadheading. And no, it's not related to the Grateful Dead, although I've never clicked on a clickable word on Wikipedia so quickly. Basically, this means that they can fly on flights that they're not scheduled to work for free. Before leaving that afternoon, Auburn lays some very important documents out on his bed, including his last will and testament. Upon arrival at the airport, strangely, Auburn boarded the plane with only a guitar case. His official Federal Express pilot bag was being repaired. The weather was perfect for flying with clear afternoon skies. Three flight crew members were running Flight 705 on the afternoon of April 7th. The 49-year-old captain, Dave Sanders, a 20-year employee of Federal Express and a Navy veteran who had fought in the Vietnam War. Jim Tucker was the 42-year-old co-pilot, a Vietnam veteran himself, like Dave, and a Federal Express employee of 10 years. And the youngin' of the flight, 39-year-old flight engineer Andy Peterson, a five-year employee of Federal Express. Despite their long and growing careers, the three were flying together that day for the first time and had never met. Auburn boards the plane with the guitar case before the rest of the crew without any need for security checks. He goes into the cockpit and pulls a circuit breaker on the control panel in the back of the cockpit. Then he goes back into the galley where the jump seats are located. Andy Tucker boards next, introducing himself to Auburn and then heading into the cockpit to begin his pre-flight checks. He notices the pulled circuit breaker and resets it. When Andy goes into the back of the plane, Auburn heads back into the cockpit and pulls the same breaker. Upon re-entering the cockpit, Andy notices again that the flip has been switched, and he again resets it. Strange. When the remaining members of the crew board, they introduce themselves to Auburn and each other. They go into the cockpit and begin what should have been an uneventful flight from Memphis to San Jose, California, with a cargo hold filled with packages, mostly electronics. Before takeoff, Auburn takes a few items out of his guitar case and stashes them just outside of the cockpit, out of view of the flight crew. 26 minutes after takeoff, the plane passes 19,000 feet, and Jim is hand-flying the plane, a perfect day. The crew carries on a casual conversation, and the cockpit door is locked open. Andy Calloway spots Auburn first from the corner of his eye. Andy's seated in the back of the cockpit. He sees him coming in and just expects that he's going to start a friendly conversation with the crew. Instead, Auburn pulls out a 20-ounce framing hammer that he had stashed before the beginning of the flight and starts beating Andy in the head. After several blows, Auburn turns to co-pilot Jim, wailing him in the head with the hammer into a stunned consciousness. By the way, this is a thing. He was still conscious, but he was literally hit so hard that he couldn't move. He didn't really know what was going on. Dave, who is looking at Auburn at this point, is literally shocked still at what he sees before his very eyes. Auburn, with the element of surprise on his side, also manages to deliver several blows to the side of Dave's head. Auburn retreats into the galley momentarily, and even though they had all been beaten in the head and terribly injured, somehow Andy, Jim, and Dave are all still alive and still conscious. Jim yells, get him, get him, as Auburn re-enters the cockpit, shouting, quote, sit down, sit down, get back in your seat, this is a real gun, I'll kill you, end quote. The gun in question 
a literal spear gun. Andy, still stunned and with a wild ringing in his ear, realizes the only thing he can do is grab the spear, poking out about four inches from the end of the gun. He grabs it with all of his strength. Dave unbuckles his seatbelt and lurches at Auburn. Jim shakes himself out of his stunned state and somehow, despite a very, very recent traumatic brain injury, grabs hold of the airplane controls. At this moment, Jim realizes that he has in his hands one of the best and really only weapons available, the actual plane. Jim Tucker, remember, was a Navy pilot, and he was also a combat instructor in that previous career. And he would later say, quote, I was looking at the situation as if it was an air combat maneuvering situation, end quote. Putting all of this training and instinct to work, Jim immediately puts the plane into a 15-degree climb. This throws Andy, Dave, and Auburn into the galley behind the cockpit. Jim then rolls the plane to the left to try and disarm Auburn. This pins all three men wrestling for the spear gun to the left side of the plane. Remember, Dave and Andy had just been beaten in their heads with a hammer, and now they're WWE-style wrestling for a spear gun. Only if WWE wrestling was for life-saving real. They're losing blood and getting weaker by the second. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, also just beaten in the head, Jim just keeps barrel-rolling the airplane, like around in a spiral. Well, not totally on its back, but to 140 degrees so that he can still see the ground, actually. Y'all, I think it's important to understand the size of this plane, okay? The F-16, which is a fighter jet, is 49 feet long. The Federal Express plane was 181 feet long. The F-16 has a wingspan of 31 feet, while the FedEx plane... That wingspan is 155 feet. I mean, we're talking like three times as big, y'all. The Federal Express cargo plane weighs about 44,000 tons, while an F-16 weighs 10 tons. 10 tons. I think it's fairly safe to say that DC-1030 cargo planes aren't meant to be rolled. They don't even have the kind of windows you'd need in order to roll the plane onto its back. Commercial planes aren't supposed to roll more than 60 degrees. So this plane, if you remember, 140 degrees, had been rolled to more than double this amount. The three men in the back are now wrestling on the ceiling of the plane. Auburn pulls the hammer free and pummels Andy in the head again. Jim then pulls the plane into a steep dive. The men are then pushed further back into the plane as it starts to go faster and, well, faster than it's even designed to go. Commercial planes are not meant to be flown more than 400 miles per hour. And Jim's got this thing going 500. Except it was probably going faster because it was at the, it was at the very end of the speedometer. Like, it couldn't go any higher. No commercial plane that survived has ever been flown this fast. Jim knew that he had to pull the plane out of the dive soon. Otherwise, the plane was going to fall apart. There's also a phenomenon that Jim was worried about at this point. It's called mock tuck. I'm sorry. I read a lot and I really tried to understand this, but my brain is not big enough. But if you're interested, I suggest a little look-see on Google. Something about the plane literally just falling apart, essentially. Oh, I should probably mention that as Jim is flying this plane so aggressively that it might actually fall apart, he is becoming paralyzed on the right side of his body from that incredibly traumatic brain injury. He looks to the left, where Dave was sitting just moments before, and notices the throttles are at their takeoff position. So he's in a vertical dive with the plane basically going at maximum power. Jim has to reduce the power with his only usable hand. Remember, he's paralyzed on the right side. And somehow he manages it by removing his working hand from the yoke, that's airplane talk for steering wheel, and pulling back the throttle on Dave's side. Meanwhile, back in the wrestling room, Dave and Andy, who are massively injured, still manage to pin Auburn to the ground and they yank the hammer out of his hand. At this point, y'all, it's only been a minute since the attack started. Jim, at this point, manages to radio ground control, saying, quote, 
Center, listen to me. Express 705, I've been wounded. We've had an attempted takeover on board the plane. Give me a vector, please, back to Memphis at this time. Hurry, end quote. The struggle is still continuing in the main body of the airplane as Jim says to ground control, quote, yeah, we need an ambulance and we need a armed intervention as well, end quote. This is the most serious request a pilot can make. So ground control, a bit stunned, notifies the SWAT team. They'll need armed officials to storm the plane as soon as it lands. However, Jim is a little mixed up as it seems, and he's actually flying away from the airport at this point. I mean, I'm guessing he pulled it out of the dive and now he's flying away from the airport. Ground control can't really do anything but watch helplessly as this is happening. They don't want to say anything to the crew in case this is a purposeful misdirection or in case the worst has happened and that the hijackers have taken over the plane. Jim, having taken the plane out of the dive but really still interested in testing the physics of keeping this plane together, starts to roll the plane in the opposite direction to the right. Flippy, flippy, flippy. He brings it back right side up, much to the relief of the people in the back, I'm guessing. And despite the fact that they have Auburn pinned to the ground, he won't let go of that spear. In anger, fear, whatever, Dave starts beating Auburn with the hammer. And according to Dave, he beats him with every ounce of strength that he has. He manages to hit Auburn in the head four times at full strength. The men start yelling at Jim to come to the back of the airplane to help, but he's a little bit busy flying the plane. They tell him to put it into autopilot and to get back there. Jim, despite being paralyzed on one side, everybody, let's not forget that, manages to get the plane into autopilot and get to the back of the plane where he sees a sight. Everything and everyone is covered in blood. Things are ripped apart everywhere. The jump seats are basically ripped out of the wall. Everything is in disarray. And Auburn is on his back and disarmed at that moment. At this moment, actually, ground control does try to establish radio contact, but there's no response because, well, everyone's in the back fighting. <laughs> Due to protocol and somehow... This crew is still able to follow protocol. Dave hands Jim the spear and heads to the front of the plane to fly it. it he's the pilot, so I guess it, it's his job to fly the plane. He is without his glasses, and he's significantly bloodied from, well, being beaten in the head with the hammer. In fact, the blood is running into his eyes, making it difficult to see. But he manages to wipe the blood away, sit down, and ask for a vector to fly back to Memphis and land the plane. At the Memphis airport runway, emergency personnel are dispatched to meet the plane. Everyone is massively wounded. Jim has a blood clot developing in his brain and he's lost feeling in his hands. He actually can't tell at this point if he's even holding the spear. Things are tenuously under control in the back of the plane, but Andy, who's pinning Auburn down, is fading fast from blood loss. Ah, uh, yes, but we're not out of danger yet, and not just because Auburn is clearly in the middle of a seriously murderous meltdown. Apparently, the plane is too heavy to land on the Memphis runway that it's clear to land on because it's still full of fuel. It's supposed to be going to San Jose, remember? There, there is a switch that you can pull to release excess fuel, which that's a whole nother story I'd rather not get into today, but that switch is in the back of the cockpit. That's the flight engineer's job, but he's currently lying with his full body weight on top of a hijacker. Dave is a little busy flying the plane. Auburn is still trying to wrestle his way out from under Andy, and he tries a new tactic of sticking his thumbs in the two guys' eyes. The struggle picks up again, and it gets just as loud and just as violent as it was before. Dave decides to level the plane, turn on autopilot, and go to the back of the plane, believing the only thing that's going to stop him is, is to kill him. That's Dave just believes that he's going to have to go to the back of the plane and kill Auburn. As he heads out of the cockpit, the two men yell that they've got it under control, or as Dave said to ground control, quote, well, it's sort of under control, end quote. But... The distraction means he's going too fast to land on the scheduled runway. This is what he's going to have to do. He's got to make a 90 degree turn. Then he'll be parallel to the new runway. He'll go past the new runway and make a 180 degree turn to get to the new runway. 
he is also going to be pushing this airplane beyond its technical limits in order to make this landing. And he does that despite almost having been beaten to death just a few minutes before. He's straight up ignoring all of the automated alarms that are going off and telling him he can't land this beast and just going for it. He doesn't believe there are any other options. There will be no pulling the plane up and trying again. Meanwhile, in the back, the hammer becomes loose and all three men are struggling to get it. For the first time in the struggle, Andy grabs the hammer, but he's too weak to yield it. Jim looks at Andy and says, quote, you've got to hit him, end quote. Somehow, Andy does. Dave manages to land the plane despite being 35,000 pounds overweight, and miraculously, all 10 tires withstand the landing impact. He stops the plane with 300 meters on the runway to spare. Dave gets out of his seat and heads to the back. He deploys the slides. They, they try to climb up the slides, but they can't. It's too slippery. I'm sorry, it's not funny. Uh, so anyway, they have to get a ladder. They put a ladder up and a firefighter is the first one to climb up. I don't know why it wasn't a SWAT team member. He being a firefighter is not even carrying handcuffs. So he yells down for someone to throw up handcuffs and they do. And he handcuffs Auburn. He then moves to examine Andy, who at this point barely has a pulse. He'll be the first to be removed from the plane. Then they'll take out Jim, Auburn, and lastly, Dave. Dave would later say, standing there, the last one on the plane, he felt a sense of euphoria that he'd never felt before, and he doesn't think he'll ever feel again. He said, quote, it was the sense of we had been there and we came back and won, end quote. All three of our crew heroes were taken to the regional medical center in Memphis in critical condition. Auburn was also taken to the same hospital for treatment. All four men and the plane would survive. So what in the actual happened? At the time of this made-for-TV drama, Auburn Calloway was a divorced father of two. He and his wife had just gone through a messy divorce four years prior in 1990. He was still trying to support both her and his children, and he wanted them to live a comfortable lifestyle, and said as much in a letter he penned to his ex-wife, later found on the cargo plane. It was made clear in the letter that he was obsessed with his financial well-being. He wrote in the letter that he didn't know how he would be able to pay for his kids' eventual Stanford educations. He was frustrated with being a flight engineer and the accompanying pay grade. But it was a little more than that. Through an investigation in the months leading up to the fateful April flight, human resources with Federal Express had developed suspicions about the flight experience that Auburn had reported when he applied to work for them. On April 8th, 1994, for those of you paying attention the next day, Auburn was going to be facing a hearing regarding falsifying those flight records for Federal Express. He had overestimated his hours of flight experience to the company. Whoops. So between the financial challenges of a divorce, his career frustrations, and facing the possibility of a career-ending dismissal from Federal Express, Auburn Kellaway hatched a plan. In the days leading up to the attack, he sent $54,000 to his ex-wife. He altered his will, and he chose some very specific weapons. Federal Express, at least at the time, provided its employees a $2.5 million life insurance policy, and that's the equivalent of $4.6 million in today's money. Spoiler alert, you don't get that life insurance if you commit suicide, but you sure as heck get that life insurance if there's a random, totally accidental plane crash. That day, when Auburn entered the cabin of the DC-1030 early, the breaker he flipped was the cockpit voice recorder. When Andy Tucker noticed the flipped breaker, Auburn tried flipping it again. Andy noticed again. But that wasn't a plot-ending plan. Auburn continued with his backup plan to incapacitate the crew with weapons that would mirror injuries produced by a plane crash. He would then fly the plane for 30 minutes until the cockpit voice recorder reset, and he would crash the plane. If it hadn't been for the fortitude and sheer will of some average heroes, Auburn probably would have gotten away with it too. 
Auburn Calloway was indicted on May 17, 1994, by a grand jury on charges of attempted air piracy and attempted murder. These were federal charges, and despite his plea in the trial of temporary insanity, the jury was not convinced. Maybe it had something to do with the spear gun? Regardless, he was found guilty, and on August 11, 1995, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Fun fact, federal sentences are not subject to parole. Use that in your next trivia competition. Tell them capers and cocktails sent ya. <laughs> anyway, airline hijackings were a very rare event in the mid-1990s, but that wasn't always the case. In the four-year period from 1968 to 1972, a period dubbed the Golden Age of Hijacking, more than 130 planes were hijacked. Sometimes it would happen more than once in the same day. Now, the mid-20th century was a different era of hijackings. Most of these folks were individuals with a political axe to grind or the desire for some quick ransom cash. Most of the time, these incidents ended in something like an inconvenience rather than an, a national tragedy. This was also at the time that a lot of us can't even imagine. There was almost no security on airplanes. You could walk right on a plane. I listened to a podcast recently actually about a girl who literally with her friend just like snuck onto an airplane and flew to New York City. No, no security, nothing. And it was easy to get away with things like that. In fact, you didn't even have to go through metal detectors until 1973. It's wild. However, airline hijackings have been on a major decline since their heyday in the mid-20th century. And airline hijackings are exceptionally rare in a post-9-11 world. There have been something like zero hijackings on flights in the United States since the massive increase of security on U.S. flights and flights worldwide after the airline hijackings on September 11th. A guy grabbed the flight controls on a Cessna in Alaska in 2021, but I'm not even sure we should count that. Even in the 90s, there were relatively few airline hijackings. Even more rare is that an airline hijacking committed by a fellow pilot. I did find one instance of this happening on a Czechoslovakian flight in March of 1950, but other than that, I did not see that happening on U.S. flights or otherwise. No wonder the whole flight crew was so stunned. Y'all, I think it's worth revisiting again, and I, I don't think that the heroics of these men can be understated. They managed to prevent a tragedy of massive scale. The plane was flying over a huge swath of the United States, and who knows where Auburn would have crashed it had he been given the chance. And this isn't really as big of a deal, but they also saved the plane. Despite the fact that it sustained like $800,000 or $1.5 million in today's money worth of property damage, well, it was repaired and continued to fly. It was actually just retired in December 31st of last year. It must have taken a lot of bleach to get rid of all that blood. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> On May 26, 1994, Dave, Jim, and Andy were awarded the Gold Medal for Heroism from the Airline Pilots Association. It's the highest award a civilian pilot can receive. They are also members of the Tennessee Aviation Hall of Fame. The men's recoveries took years. Jim Tucker had to learn how to walk and talk again and had three major brain surgeries. I might add he also had to have about a fourth of his skull totally recreated. Whew. He ended up with a small seizure disorder. The other men faced similar struggles in the months and years following the incident. Dave had several deep gashes in his face and doctors had to sew his right ear back on. Andy had a fractured skull as well and his temporal artery was severed. Because of the extent and severity of their injuries, None of the crew were ever certified as medically fit to fly commercially again. One or two of them have started flying smaller planes for recreation again, but none will ever work as pilots because of what happened on that day. Auburn Calloway appealed to President Obama during his administration requesting a presidential pardon. Among other things, he said, quote, Although I incurred the most serious injuries in the fracas, I took full responsibility and apologized to my fellow crew members in a letter that was published in the no local newspaper. I derived no possible benefit from my conduct, which makes what I did a self-victimizing crime with no criminal intent, end quote. Yeah, okay, Auburn. By the way, I never found that apology letter either. 
On March 25th, 2021, he sent a similar, maybe even direct copy of a letter to President Biden asserting, quote, what matters most is that there are good people who have served our country honorably and sacrificially in every branch of the U.S. military, but have also suffered misfortunes under the criminal justice system. From the highest general to the lowest private, we have all served and suffered in one way or another, end quote. He probably sent the same copy of this damn letter to every single president since he's been incarcerated, but we have to suffer through it because he put it on the internet himself for us all to read. <sighs> Auburn R. Calloway remains incarcerated at the United States Penitentiary Atwater, a high-security federal prison in Merced County, California. Unless some president heeds his frequent and mostly false requests, he will remain imprisoned for the rest of his natural life. Thanks for hanging out with me. I guess I picked the Bloody Mary for a couple of reasons, am I right? But um, shh. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. There are a lot of sources in the description box, including an episode from a UK documentary television series called Survival in the Sky, which you can watch for free on YouTube. Get on watching that right now. Okay, y'all know the drill. Like, subscribe, review, comment, share, drink, drink some more. And if you want, book me for your next virtual happy hour. All the details are in that final the description box. Next week, we're making one of the first known cocktails ever created, in the United States at least. It's called the Chatham Artillery Punch, the strongest drink in America that was, unsurprisingly, created by some chaps in the U.S. military during the Civil War. That's because our story has a small connection to the Civil War, but it also has a small medium connection to the Masons, a medium connection to populism, a medium large connection to digging up a corpse from a local cemetery, and a very large connection to cement. Anyway, if you're the mocktail fan, I suggest checking out the ingredients. I've included some links to a rum syrup and a non-alcoholic bourbon that, while a little pricey, we will use in drinks for months and months to come. Might be worth the investment if you like the booziness without, well, booze. Third Tuesday is a skipped upload, so I'll see you in two weeks. And remember, there are always alternatives to attempting to commandeer and crash an entire plane for your life insurance scheme.